Natural Order Podcast, Episode 14. Welcome to the Natural Order Podcast with your hosts, Ryan O'Leary and Adam Heyman. Natural Order Podcast, back again. Brian O'Leary here with Adam Heyman. Hello, Brian. How are you today? I'm well. So Adam's coming off a recent, what, appearance, I guess, because it was on video, too, uh, on the Bob Murphy Show, episode 292. And yes, Bob uh, throws the exceptional ones up on his YouTube channel as well. <laughs> and I, I made the cut. Very, there you go. And so I was listening to it last week, and it got me thinking. And so I did a podcast on what Adam, or it actually wasn't even what you guys were thinking in the in the show, but you offhandedly mentioned Jack Handy, or Bob did maybe, uh, from Saturday Night Live. And of course, you know, Adam knew exactly who, what Bob was talking about, or maybe you brought it up and Bob knew exactly what you were talking about. Can't remember offhand, uh, but you can go into that more in a, in a second. But I was like, man. Everybody I knew back then knew who Jack Handy was. And Jack Handy, I thought until recently, was, was just like a character they made up on Saturday Night Live. But no, he was a writer that was on there for years. and uh, But he was, everybody knew who he was. And maybe in this generation, that that's not the case. And so my podcast kind of went in. I'm like, well, Saturday Night Live, I don't even really know anybody on the show anymore, hardly. I don't watch it, but I'm sure a lot more people do watch it than they watched it back in the 80s and 90s uh and maybe even the 70s like they they had that show had uh you know a few really stark periods of where it was really uh successful and part of the cultural zeitgeist but anyway uh so i was kind of lamenting the fact to some degree that i that i didn't know and you know even though it what more people probably watch Saturday Night Live than ever before. It's just as a percentage of the culture since the, or the population, since we've grown tremendously, probably in the last 30 years, million, you know, hundreds of millions of people, probably a <laughs> uh, hundred million, whatever it might, might, might be. Uh, it's just, there's more things, right? There's just more things to offer. So, uh, and then we were, we were chatting, Adam and I, and we said, I, I got some ideas that um, I want to throw by you, why you might feel this way. So uh, I don't know what these ideas are, and Adam is going to maybe pepper me with uh, some thoughts. <laughs> well, let me, uh, <laughs> let me start off by, uh, by noticing that in the content creation landscape, uh -huh. I guess we're part of that, you just never know what your audience is going to take away from what you create. Yeah. And here Bob has me on to ask me a poker theory and strategy related question. It's a two hour podcast a, and I pick out a, like an a obscure 10 second movie thing. about a, right. About a, with Robert Redford about Havana. And, uh, and we talk about the libertarian party for a little bit. And then we dive into some esoteric concepts about epistemology and knowledge and certainty and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. And then Brian hears that and goes off on a podcast of his own about <laughs> Saturday Night Live, Jack Handy, and baseball, and why we don't <laughs> – like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, it just goes to show. I mean, the, the podcast was great, and it's it's much longer than what we typically do on this show, but we'll we'll see how this this one goes. We don't we don't really have a time limit on this one, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And um, No, it was great. I, I hope people check it out. We'll put it on, on the show notes page, the Bob Murphy Show on his own website and on YouTube. Yeah. But you were saying you were sort of, uh, I mean, what would you call it? You weren't lost in reverie exactly about the past, but you were talking about the passion you used to have about things like Saturday Night Live and baseball. Right. And that that's changed over time. Yeah. And uh, maybe if you remember what your, your thesis was there, I, I have some hypotheses for why that might be, but uh, why don't you uh, set the floor? Well, set the table. I, I guess my... I was just trying to figure out in my head why these things aren't as important as they once were. Granted, you know, I'm, I'm much older, certainly. And, uh, you know, as far as baseball goes, you know, that's all I wanted to be. And, you know, as a child was a big league ball player. And, you know, so I knew all that stuff. But, I, you know, baseball's been part of my life and part of, like, just the fabric of my life for forever. 
and to some degree Saturday Night Live was, you know, a certain age started watching it, not too young, but, you know, through throughout high school and college, certainly it was part of the deal. We used to sit around and watch Saturday Night Live on Saturday nights, you know, <laughs> late into the night and uh and it was just part of the part of the deal. But not so much anymore. I haven't watched an episode for a long time and uh maybe perhaps the style of humor or the political uh tilt they've taken is just and maybe that's just, I think that's off really perhaps the same thing with not only baseball but just a lot of the pro sports leagues and stuff. Uh oh, I know what you mean. And as yeah. you said on your podcast, you know, you used to like set the timer and get to the TV and make sure you watched a game, maybe every game. And now it's like you could take her to leave it. And well, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Cause you have, or I have the ability now to watch pretty much anything I want to watch at anything. any given time, pretty much yeah. except the movie Havana. <laughs> you said it was very <laughs> hard, hard to, to find. find. <laughs> it's hard to find, but I've seen it. I, I, I watched it years ago and, uh, but yeah, like you can watch you know, any of the streaming platforms, free or paid. There's so much content out there, and it's all, almost all like pretty good. the The sports stuff, it's pretty easy to find, and there's a lot of it. And it's just like maybe back in the day, having to search for that stuff was part of the deal. Like I read a lot more about the games. And sports in the whether it was in the morning newspaper or Sports Illustrated or the sporting news that came every mm -hmm. week and you get a recap of what happened or like the little clip shows that are on for half hour uh, per week, whether it's uh, baseball this week in baseball was one, the NFL films presents or whatever one of those. Sure. And it's like, you know. Uh, so suffice it to say that something has changed. Something we're has definitely using, changed. We're going to be using SNL and baseball. OK. But yeah. I think for the listener, you know, and for myself, you could substitute anything. Right. It's clearly the case as, as time has gone by, my interest and passion for certain things is just not what it used to be. Yeah. So, but I would also argue that so, your... some things have increased several fold. Passion. Sure, sure. Passions, okay. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. So I, uh, listening to your podcast, I came up with seven hypotheses okay, for well, what might seven. be going on. So we're going <sighs> to... Go through them rapid fire. You take notes, and then we'll discuss which ones you think hold water and which are just nonsense. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, number one. These things just suck now. <laughs> they used to be worth obsessing over, but now, not so much. The quality is diminished. That's one. And I'm giving these to you in no particular order. Okay. I don't want to sway you. Yeah. Um, second, you are older now. And therefore, you have more pressing concerns. So, just a time issue. Number three. You are older now, and your brain is full. It's full of knickknacks, all sorts of things you know and are interested in. And you simply don't have the room in your limited cranial space for trivialities mm -hmm. like SNL yeah. and maybe baseball. Here's my fourth one. Back then, when you were younger, there were less entertainment and sports media options, so almost everybody watched the same stuff. Like, back when there were only three major networks and a few scattered locals in your area, everybody watched the same thing on TV. But as you were mentioning earlier, now there's this massive explosion in the kind of content that you, mm -hmm. that you can watch and where you can get it from. So maybe you're attention span and is just busy with all these other things. Number five, uh, you are older now and your tastes have simply changed. You sort of intellectually say you still love baseball, but is it the same feeling as you had when you were younger? You know, is the quality of your interest and care, has it changed just because you're older? Um, Number six, um, it's about maybe there's less cultural cohesion. Because there's all these different media and entertainment options, 
Is there a splintering of society that you've fallen into as a, as a phenomenon? And is it natural? Is it a function of the increased size of the country be now between when you were younger? Um, or is it not size at all? Are there unnatural forces promoting cultural disunity? Mm. I mean, I don't know if that has anything to do with baseball. Maybe it does. Uh, it probably has something to do with SNL. Mm -hmm. um, and for myself, I stopped watching sports, the few that I did watch uh, early in 2020, just because I, I was just offended by what they were doing on the right. field. There was the BLM stuff, but before that, you know, they were doing military crap I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And then they started having these healthy young you know, 20 year olds wearing masks on the <laughs> side of the field. I just, I just didn't want to watch it anymore. I was just yeah. over it. Yeah. Um, and then the seventh one, maybe similar to the others is you are older now and therefore you are more able to see these things clearly that you used to like. They haven't changed. You have your values have, even if you don't recognize it. Hmm. Okay. I think they're all valid to some degree. Um, I mean, it's kind of like what I touched on at the top. What struck me on number six when you're were, you were talking uh, cultural cohesion and perhaps a splintering of the culture, I, that struck me because I also see this in, in music. Mm -hmm. uh, and it probably happened, this started happening probably in the 90s, I'm guessing, where uh, the, the radio was the place where you went for your music most of the time. The top 40 or alternative rock, classic rock, country, um, maybe... R&B stations or whatever. And then you have the outliers of like classical music and jazz, which have their, you know, unique, uh, you know, they're, they're smaller, but passionate fan bases. So those are, those are always there and still are there actually. Um, but as far as music goes, I, I would listen to everything, you know, like everything. And it started, I think, like I said, in the nineties where country music kind of changed, became this more poppy pop based country music and it was very entertaining and it's kind of my wheelhouse of country even though it's probably not my favorite era it's just like what i know the best and and a lot of it's just <laughs> frankly like garbage but it's kind of fun and same thing but the I, I would go back to the 1980s like you go look at the top 40 charts and you have british american r&b like start and then maybe in that that same era where you had the the kind of the country music starting, the rap also started and kind of took the place. So it became a white black thing almost, mm. which is which is really strange and kind of depressing to me because you know I I didn't really care you know who who what but who was singing what I, I like and I was thinking about this earlier today and I'm like God, and it came up some somehow this name came up a couple times in the last uh, few weeks for me. Random name, actually, probably, if you think about it, but Anita Baker. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. Anita Baker. She was sure. just awesome. And I loved, I loved her singing, probably still do. But Anita Baker would never get airplay today, even though she's got right. just tremendous voice, great songs, just like you just feel good about listening to Anita Baker for what, of what, like one person. And I don't know where she fits in today's world. And I was thinking about, like, good grief. Like, the the whole Taylor Swift phenomenon is going on now. I, like, that. talk about cultural splintering. This has splintered pretty much everything in the culture, this woman. I don't even know the you appeal just, of uh, her. I don't even know the, the I don't even know her songs. Nor do I care. No. Um, but what you said gave me an idea. Hmm. It used to be, back in the day, before MTV, you'd turn on your radio, probably only at a handful of stations, and mm -hmm. then they'd play something. Yeah. And, you know, you'd, you'd pick the genre that you liked. You know, country would be different than rock, which would be different than classical and jazz mm -hmm. or whatever else is out there. But you would experience the music just as audio, and right. you'd either like it or you wouldn't. Then, 
because the we exploded into video and then eventually you know the internet and all these other forms not only are you experiencing the music but you're getting the whole essence of who these people are so you can be turned on or turned off by the look and the feel like like you said rap you know it's a splintering of black and white well you know if it's just audio maybe you don't even know Mm -hmm. But what if you, you know, see something, and, you know, if you've got some sort of racial preference or a cultural preference, mm -hmm. something about what the person is doing while they're singing their song uh, could offend you or attract you. And yeah. that wouldn't be the case on radio, right? Yeah. And I, I liked a lot of the, like the late 80s, early 90s rap, uh, just like I liked the country music. But I stopped listening to country music really around, you know, the early 2000s probably for the or new stuff for the most part. Unless it's like some weird subgenre of, uh, like rock, you know, like rock and roll, country kind of melded together. But the, you know, the top, well, whatever. It's not top forty, but essentially that kind of station, the popular country. I I just I don't even listen to it. It's grating on my ears. The same thing goes with the rap music. Like I just don't understand like how people like this stuff anymore. But they do, and more people. <laughs> buy this stuff than ever before and it's more popular within certain realms of uh you know, like pieces pieces of the culture so and, and getting back to baseball i guess maybe it was where you wanted to go on this whole topic the the numbers say that baseball is the most popular it's ever been most popular it's ever been now where you have uh, more children playing youth baseball. You have more revenue, more attendance than ever at the major league level. And that doesn't even move the needle for me anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as a old school baseball fan, I was like, oh, great. Like, this is, this is awesome. Great developments. More kids are playing. More people are watching. And, you know, making more money than ever. The players are making gobs of money. And it's like, it it just doesn't just doesn't hold a candle to what I grew up with, and a lot of the players are frankly better. They're better, uh, not all sure. of them, but the game the game itself to me is uh, much different. I, I mean, we can go into that. I mean, I. But what changed? It's either the game or it's you, and I think it's worth exploring. Yeah, because it, I think it's, it's a little kind of universal. It, I don't think you're little, the only one. It's a little bit of both. Uh, you know we. Talk about the Pareto principle, eighty twenty rule. I, I would I would probably say it's eighty percent game, twenty percent me. I don't know. Uh, I, I definitely have changed. You know, I'm I am older. I got more things competing with my attention, and uh, but the same thing goes with you know all pro pro sports. I I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and the Portland Trailblazers were a legitimate part of the culture in that city. Everybody knew all the players for the most part. They we we didn't even have home games televised on television like they do now. Every game's on television. We had to listen if we wanted to to know what's going on in the game. We had to turn on the radio and listen to Bill Shonley do the play by play. And you know, if if we were lucky, there'd be a nationally televised game uh, on you know the weekend or uh, or and then it, when she got in the Blazers got in the playoffs you could see them on TV and that was huge like oh wow we got to see all the road games or most of the road games on television but you can never watch the home games unless you went to the game itself or occasionally there were a closed circuit television at movie theaters uh, for the, for some of the bigger games and so like you had to buy a ticket and nowadays you don't you don't have to buy a ticket. You got, you buy, you know, for a really a nominal price, you can watch all these games, and, and you pay a hundred bucks. A, I pay a hundred bucks a year, and I watch. I can watch n or replay ninety plus percent of every single major league baseball game that was played. And if I was a kid, I don't, I don't, I, I would. That would that sounded like the most awesome thing ever to me. <laughs> For a hundred dollars, I wonder if it. Uh, I wonder if it would have if back then you actually did have that ability to watch everything. You might have got overloaded. I think what's Maybe. going on is uh, is mostly a crowding out effect. Like back okay. in the day, Saturday Night Live was just was what was on, mm -hmm. and so you watched it even if half of it was just garbage. Yeah. You know, 
and you watched it even if the cast members changed and they weren't your cup of tea. But now there's so much that you can watch. It seems like a massive error, waste of time to, to watch something that like by the, before I'd quit football and basketball uh-huh. you know, in disgust in 2020, I was already resentful of how much time my, of my week was just taken away by these things. Right. I was playing fantasy football and, you know, watching every Sunday. And also then it would be what Monday night and yeah. Thursday night. I mean, yeah. it's a lot of goddamn time <laughs> that I'm spending watching this stupid sport. And yeah. it's a great sport. You that know, you I love, love it, but you love, but I'm three years clean and I, I don't miss it at all. Mm. And I, I think, so again, it's a crowding out thing because the reason I don't miss it is I've got so much yeah. that, that I'm interested in that I can now consume right on tv radio podcasts satellite radio uh you know there's and let's not forget books i used to read i used to read all the time uh-huh. <laughs> and i still read more than anyone on my block but it's like a tenth of what it was when i was a kid yeah so i agree yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm right there with you it's so it just feels like such a waste to to spend a second or a minute on something that that, that you don't think is valuable yeah, and if it's not valuable, I, I, there's, I, see, I come from this whole childhood that was sports. I didn't understand why you wouldn't play sports all the time. I, you know, my motivation for going to school for the most part is so my folks would let me play sports <laughs> um, until I hit college. And then, you know, in college, it, that was a eye opener at first, but then I kind of, you know, dug in and did the schoolwork and got out of there. But, uh, and then I, then I took, you know, a, kind of a few years off where I was, was not really that into sports as much. It was always there, but, uh, I had different passions. You know, I got, I got really into fly fishing and really into it. And that took up all my time. And now I go fishing a couple times a year, maybe it was, but it was the same it takes thing. Yeah. Takes a pretty small hook to catch a fly, right? Yes, it does, and uh, that's part that might that might be part of the problem. I was having trouble catching the flies, <laughs> but I do have Chopsticks. I do have one of these bug assault things now uh, that I, that my where you put the salt <laughs> in, in like a rifle looking thing. It's pretty awesome, but anyway, uh, but yeah, you know, so different passions. Uh, now, I mean, and when we do this podcast, I never would never thought that I'd be podcasting. There was no such thing, right? Right. There's no such thing. And then realize, like, oh man, I really like doing this. I like talking out ideas and doing and doing all this stuff with good people, you included. Amen. Buddy. At Reraiser on Twitter, you can find more. <laughs> trying to encourage you to do that more, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, I just I just think that you know th- this thing, doing podcasts and you know really trying to figure out what this culture and where it's headed, and putting a lot of my time and energy toward figuring that out and possibly for, uh, providing solutions for people, that's taken up a lot. Like you said, like the the time, you know, like I am older, but I uh, and the time commitments have changed. However, um, yeah, we can do still do a lot, a lot of things. We're not just we're not just limited to podcasting or talking about libertarian concepts or whatever. You know, that's boring in and of itself too. At, at a certain hey, point, if you get too much, if hey, you get, my feelings. <laughs> well, if you get too, if you, if that's all you do, like yeah, you, know, um, you know, I think the you know having a broad. Swap, but like you're, I guess how you're saying, you know, back then you had less options. So the options you chose, most everybody else chose them too, just because, just by virtue of there not being a whole lot of things. But now I can, I can go right now or after we're done, I can post a 30 second video that goes to all these social media channels. People could watch that or not. I, but I spend the time doing that. It's like, Anybody can do anything. Anybody can do a podcast. Uh, we just do it better than others. Oh, no, you're not wrong. Um, there's really something, too, about the splintering or the the pro- 
proliferation of other options for people's attention. Um, there's a song by the band called Five for Fighting. Yeah. I think it's called Slice. And it's really beautiful. Maybe we'll link to it in the show notes where he uh, he opines about just the change. You know, we all used to go to the same place on, you know, Saturday night and mm-hmm. concerts that you'd go to were a big thing because you, you couldn't get music any other way. And now, you know, you turn on your computer and internet connection and the whole world, you know, is available to you. So rather than connect with your local community and your family, even, um, you know, you're finding some sliver of thing that all you and maybe a thousand other people in the entire planet are into. And so you spend all your time there, you know, you find your community there mm-hmm. and there's some good aspects of that that are great, but we also clearly are losing something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, maybe as we mature as a species, we'll find the balance there because yeah. you don't want to, you it's know, possible. Mark Zuckerberg not... can go to hell. You don't want to dive into virtual reality and only live there. That's, that's empty, you know? Yeah. Real yeah. life still has uh, valuable things you don't want to lose. I would posit this also. And I think maybe who clarified this for me, was possibly Brian McClanahan. Not, I'm not entirely sure, but it's some one of the podcasts I listen to on a regular basis. He was saying, or whoever this was, saying that the United States was probably no uh, more united at any one point, other than maybe after the Revolutionary War, soon thereafter, than for probably five, ten, fifteen years after World War II ended. Or during during and after World War II, the nation came came together. There was a there was a sliver, real sliver of that after nine eleven, but that ended very quickly. Uh, I think it had lasted for a few weeks, not a number of years. And perhaps that is part of the rub. There, the little petty grievances that people have with each other mushroom into big grievances. We see it now in politics in particular. I mean, you just see like, all right, if the guy has an R next to his name or a D next to his name, people just automatically reject that person. And even within you know, your libertarian party, there's a, uh, there's not, it's not a cohesive movement necessarily, even though you're, you're a, a, amongst the leadership trying to perhaps provide that. But within the libertarian sphere, there's also a lot of like, people that reject this other person or this other philosophy just because it doesn't meet up with um, some litmus test that they have for being a libertarian and the cult. So the cult that, that is like a microcosm of the culture at large. I think Scott Horton on Tom's podcast the other day, he's like, you got 130 million Republicans over here, 130 million uh, Democrats over here. You got libertarians in the middle about a million, maybe, give or take, and then they're all fighting with each other too. So, uh, I don't know where, the, where you go with that. Well, you uh, you just outlined something that's a big—I don't know if "feature" is the right word, but a big aspect of humanity, mm-hmm. and I think it bears closer examination. Um, us being as a country most most united after World War II and after nine eleven shows that our species comes together and unifies after fear, pain, and rage. Mm. And those, I submit to you, humble listener and co-host, are not the ideal ways for us to unite as a species. We should be able to unite on a positive vision of some kind, right? A set of values, a high, uh, raise our eyes up above the horizon and seek something to aspire to and unite around that. I've never been a believer, but I think Christianity was, you know, an attempt at that. I think the enlightenment was also an attempt at that, you know, to try and find something positive to hold as a unifying vision. Um, The desire for peace and productivity uh, you know, thriving, flourishing as a species. Mm-hmm. That, that could be a thing we could unite around. But, I mean, what you said is obviously true. Our species or our country is the most united when we hate somebody mm-hmm. and, we, and we're and we afraid of them. 
Right. And that is, yes, it unites us, <laughs> but it's not the best way. You know, what, I don't think we want world peace and unification because all of a sudden we're fighting off invading hordes of Martians or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we should understand that dichotomy or disparity and aim towards the positive because if we don't then the only time we're going to be united is when we're experiencing deep fear and hatred and rage and that's not good mm -hmm. yeah i agree like in a you know big umbrella that uh, th those ideas and thoughts need to move forward i i just I don't see it happening in the short term. I think stuff like this, like just talking about it and getting out there in, in a measured way, right? I don't think we're firebrands by any means. We, we can be both of us, but we're not firebrands in the way that gets ratings on Fox News or MSNBC, where all you do is <laughs> throw insults at the other other, per other person, but that's entertainment and people flock to that and they think they're getting some intellectual uh, discussion when it's really not. They have no. seven minutes that's to empty fill, calories. They have seven minutes to fill a segment and then they move on to the commercial. It leads right into the commercial and they get paid for that. And yeah, that's empty calories for your head. That's not, right. <laughs> you're not learning anything. Yeah, I mean, and again, you can, you know, there's some people on there that will say good things and the right things, but that gets drowned out, like, in a big way. Uh, and I, I just don't know, you know, where to, where to go with that, uh, because you, you have this kind of whole power structure that is not only political in nature, but also within the uh, mass media where, again, you know, it's, it's just power and money and it's not the ideas. And even in the schools these days, it's not, it's not necessarily money because, uh, well, it is to some degree, but not at the scale that we're talking about with politics and media, but it's power. It's power over like telling these kids how to think in a totally insane manner. And, uh, you know, I saw news this morning as we're recording that in Portland, Oregon, where I'm from, that the teachers were going to go on strike. It's like, yeah, get it. You know, you need to make money, but like in, in the whole, the whole scheme of things, you're negotiating. This is the biggest problem. What I find with the, uh, government schools is that they're, they're negotiating against the, <laughs> the same people that are their benefactors. And I, I just don't know where you go with that. Um, but I mean, that, that's a little off topic, I guess, perhaps off topic of Anita Baker, Saturday Night Live and baseball, which we need to <laughs> Well, it all fits as long as we title this episode, Hey, you kids get off my lawn. Right. It's not really, I mean, I, I kind of, I don't even feel that way. You know, like the old, like old man yelling at cloud or get off my lawn type thing. I don't either. I really don't. I don't either. Because those people one were of the bitter for some reason. Pill. We don't know why. Like, we don't really know why they're bitter. They have like other things going on. Not, they're not concerned with culture. <laughs> you mm. know, back, that typical guy. But anyway. No, well, I don't know what, what makes him want. Right. Maybe he just really loves his lawn. Yeah. Um. You know, one of the white pills about all this is also the cause, I think, of the reason you don't like baseball or SNL so much anymore. Mm -hmm. It's that proliferation of options. It does mean that the gatekeepers that used to hold us back, you know, those cable TV idiots, used to be only three channels. And mm -hmm. then now we're talking about how old school it is that you're talking about cable TV at all because you got the whole Internet. And I think that's great. Um the fact that Joe Rogan has, you know, more influence than uh, Bill O'Reilly ever could have hoped to, you know, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. The, the, yeah. Maybe the gates are still up, but the fences have been knocked down. And who knows what is going to rise up in the hierarchy of this decentralized freedom and capture the attention of, you know, millions of people. Right. Somebody like Lex Friedman or something, you know, or Dave Smith or 
you know, who knows? But uh, the options are could be at the it vanguard. It would be bad yeah. if it was. Yeah, it would be bad if the if the the gatekeepers were were calcified, ossified, and you had to hope that they would die or bribe them or take control. But you don't have to anymore. You just go around them, and I think that's ultimately pretty encouraging. Yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we're at, we are at the vanguard of the revolution, revolution as far as all that goes, because you know you see like the death, essentially, of this uh, former culture or at least an edifice of a culture with all the things we were talking about and now you have like you said largely or things are becoming more decentralized in some way but a friend of mine sent me something this morning uh i gotta find it here um so again again going back to portland oregon and the schools uh or this is the state of oregon headline from the Oregonian this morning uh, or yesterday said Oregon again, because they've done this before. Oregon again says students don't need to prove mastery of reading, writing, or math to graduate, citing harm to students of color. And (laughs) that kind (laughs) of... Exactly. Great reaction, by the way. Uh, Because this is that's delightful. Yeah, they're just a low, you, uh, lowering of expectations to graduate. But my, I guess the point of why I brought that up is that we have these decentralized ways to move around this idiocy and just like, yeah, I want my kid to read. I want him to do math. <laughs> we do that every day around here. You know, I've been saying for decades that it's very stupid to ensure something so important as the education of the children to something as obviously bad as a government monopoly. Right. And people would say for years, well, you just must hate kids or you must hate education. You know, what's going to happen? These kids aren't going to be able to read and write. And then cut record scratch to today and the school official saying what you just said. Yeah, no, it's insane. <laughs> so get, getting, I guess, to my point about the teacher strike, is like, what are you striking for if you're not going to do your job? Like 98% of the Portland teachers voted to go on strike starting at the beginning of November. If they don't, I don't even, I didn't get as far as what their demands were. I'm sure it's more pay, but like, what are you teaching them if the standard... What makes you think they're not doing their job? Well, Who's if, the customer? Who's paying them? It's not the parents. Not the parents. But if the standard... So what's if the, their job? <laughs> if the standard is th- that you don't have to be able to read or write or That's right. do math... That's correct. They are but living up to that to have, standard. You have to have the right ideology. The customers are paying for that. And by customer, I mean the state. Right. I mean, these teachers are doing their job. We're mm-hmm. just still confused. We're believing the myth about who the customers are. Right. It's not the students and it's not the parents. Customer, the, the piper pays the, calls the tune. I uh, forget that. I mangled yeah. that saying, yeah, yeah. but you know what I mean. Whoever is paying is the customer. Yeah. And I think people wh- whistling Yankee around here and uh, they're just the, the. He who pays the piper calls the tune. Yeah. There. And the schools, you know, I went to I went to the government schools for, you know, first through eighth grade. It was like you didn't really know any different. Most of the most of your friends were that's who the, that's where they went, and that's the way most of it is today. There's the private schools, you know. We were having this discussion last night at the dinner table, and it's like, well. So if they're asking for more money, the the teacher they have to get paid because it's because it's insanely expensive, or and getting more insanely expensive due to inflation and and other things, uh, for these teachers to be able to afford to to work really or live even close to near where they they work, especially where I am, and I said yeah. But so they need more money. So you think like going down the block and say, oh, we need an extra 20, 20 grand per house to, you know, to make the schools functioning again. They're like, no. Well, look, dude, this is wildly off topic for Jack Handy. Yeah. But there's no way in the world that you can 
point to a system that is monopolized where there are no choices, there is no market mechanism, mm. and then tell me that the only thing that's going to fix this is if I jack your taxes up and pay more. Yeah. You know, that is not demonstrated. That is not in evidence. Free the system, free the people. And let's just see. I have the sneaking suspicion that you will get a much better education for everybody yeah. at a drastically reduced cost. Right. Uh, just a guess, but I would bet heavily on that. I, yeah, I would too. So let me uh, let me tie this up a little bit. And you mentioned the marketplace and talked about marketplace of ideas and the marketplace of education. What struck me with all these hypotheses, getting back to Jack Handy and baseball and all this stuff, is is there really a, a free market and all that stuff? Do are we a really are we really allowed or are we more allowed now to choose something? Is that the free market at work or was there no real free market in choices or is that just a wildly uh, esoteric? Well, a free market is a concept. We've never had one. All right. It's a spectrum. It's more right. or less free, more or less statist. We've never had a free anything in this country. Right. Um, but my argument is that the more you go in one direction over the other, you're going to get better outcomes. Do you think we're moving that way? Um, I think Corey DeAngelo, DeAngelo uh, what's his name? Corey DeAngelo in the, in the school choice movement is doing well. It's a step in the right direction. Uh -huh. But the culture and the political will overall is going in the other direction. Right. So. I don't know. Well, I'm I think not I think what like you're talking about the school choice and the uh, you know, there's more children in homeschool than ever before, perhaps or probably before the pioneer days, uh, as a percentage or as a percentage, but certainly as a sheer number. Um, but like I said, with the baseball, it's like yeah, you're gonna get more kids playing baseball if there's more kids. You're gonna get more homeschoolers if there's more <laughs> kids. You know, just. Well, I think the percentage is way up too. I think yeah. it's up over ten. Yeah, and that's just a a symptom of a the failure of the of the monopolist system, and b the recognition finally of the parents as to how bad it is. Mm. You know, that's one yeah. silver lining of this COVID nonsense response is yeah. that parents got to see inside the schooling in a way they never did. Yeah, and I, I guess getting back to the World War Two. 9-11 analogy it's like well we we were kind of united in in seeing a lot of these things that we never saw before but everything's fine again now for the most part for these people <laughs> yeah yeah we don't need get off my lawn yeah no need no need to apologize for what happened it was it, it sucked then but uh yeah we're just don't worry don't worry about it we're we're doing we're on the right path now it's like the, the lessons by and large were never learned even though we could we had the opportunity to see a lot of these things. I think our show, our movement in some, you know, broad terms is pointing that out. And I just recommend, uh, well, that you sign up for Tom Woods School of Life, I guess, where we first met Adam. com slash T-S-O-L, and you can uh, see what we have to offer there. All right. Well, I think we've said it all. I do encourage people, if they're still with us, to go check out my episode with Bob Murphy on The Bob Murphy Show on his YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It goes all over the place. And Bob is real smart and funny, and I'm me. So check it out. Yeah. No, it's a great episode. And uh... All right, gang. We will uh, talk to you down the road. And... Uh... Well, have a good week or weekend whenever you're listening to this. Take care. Bye-bye. For more, head on over to naturalorderpodcast.com. For today's show notes, head on over to naturalorderpodcast.com slash ep14 that's naturalorderpodcast.com slash ep14